Hello, this is Kerry Schutz with MathWorks, and in this video, I'm going to show how to measure the transfer function of a continuous time or analog system. In this uh, video, I'm going to show how to do that using a uh, T-coil circuit. So it's going to be a SimScape implementation of what is known as a T-coil circuit. So I'm going to just drag in a pre-constructed version of that to save myself some time. Again, this is SimScape. All the values have already been substituted in for each component. Uh, you can see those annotated uh, above or around each component. So the next thing I'm gonna do is just define what are my inputs and what are my outputs. Uh, my output is going to be a voltage across ZL here. And my input voltage, I'm gonna drive input voltage into ZS with respect to ground. So for the voltage measurement, I'm going to bring in a voltage sensor block. That's a SimScape block. I'm gonna just hook up it around ZL. Okay, and on the drive side, I'm going to bring in a controlled voltage source. Again, that's gonna drive a voltage into ZS, the left side of it. And now we need to make the transition from, um, from Simulink into Simscape and from Simscape back into Simulink. So to do that, there's something called these physical signal converter blocks. So from the Simulink side, we could go from Simulink to physical signal in that direction. On the other side, you could just type PS here for a shortcut and we'll go the other direction. All right, now I'm gonna just tidy this up so we take advantage of hierarchy and simulate to avoid flat models. I'm gonna select all that, say create a subsystem. Uh, by default, it just calls it subsystem, so I'll call it T-coil circuit. And if you don't like the input names and output names, you might want to tell what it was. If this is V1, I'll call that the input. I'll call V2 the output. And now we need to drive, you know, V1 and measure out the output on V2. Uh, in order to do that, I'm going to use a block that I've already created. It's got transfer function estimator analog. I'm going to drive from the excitation port into the input of my circuit. I'm going to take the response of my circuit put it into the response input. I'm also going to take the excitation and measure it on the reference input. So every time you make a transfer function measurement, it's by definition a two channel measurement. You have to measure the input, you have to measure the output and take the ratio in some intelligent way. All right, uh, so the first thing we need to do then, or the next thing, is to configure our transfer function estimator. We have to know something about the bandwidth of the system. In this case, I'm going to say it's around 200 gigahertz. Uh, that's my measurement bandwidth of interest. Uh, how many frequency points? 1,000. Uh, number of averages, 100. It's fine. These measurements aren't necessarily critical. You can always experiment with them. Hold off time, I'm going to say just one nanosecond. Now, in many cases, uh, you won't know what that hold off time is. Uh, what you're essentially trying to do with that is avoid measuring the transit response or you're not you don't want to include the transit response as part of the transfer function measurement you want to get it in steady state so that's a way to avoid that transient response uh, you just essentially ignore the output for so uh, long one nanosecond in this case if you don't know it you can also just you know experiment with it or just actually test it so you could delete that line bring in a step input and say, I want this to step at time zero from zero to one volt um, using continuous time. That's what the zero is for. Put that there. I'll only run it, I'll only run it in this case for like, uh, I'll say 10 nanoseconds. Uh, and I'll put a scope on the output. So right now we're not using this broadband excitation to do a frequency domain measurement. We're using this very uh, transient like signal to just get a quick step response to know what our hold off time would be. We can run that for 10 nanoseconds. Oh, it tells me that there's no solver configuration block in my model. You must have that for Simscape models. So I'm, I, I, I frequently forget to add that. 
So I'm going to add it in there. I'm going to say solver configuration. It doesn't simulate. It's just necessary infrastructure for Simscape models. So let's just add that in. Let's go ahead and run it for 10 nanoseconds now. And I'll bring up my scope. Here it is. It's running for 10 nanoseconds. I'll go ahead and hit stop. It looks like we're already in steady state. I will zoom in on the very beginning of this waveform. And you can see that there is, wow, that's one hundredth of a nanosecond there. Uh, a tenth of a nanosecond occurs out here. So well within a fraction of a, nanos, a nanosecond, we are at steady state. So I will just say uh, for the hold off time, a tenth of a nanosecond is fine. Everything else there looks good. Or you could probably even leave that at zero. It wouldn't hurt just to completely leave the hold off time at zero. It's very, very short. All right. So now we, do, we don't need the scope anymore. We're going to now do our frequency domain measure as opposed to a time domain centric one. And let's just follow up here. We can auto fill it space bar and let's run it. Uh, this time we need to run it for longer than 10 nanoseconds when you're doing broadband measurements. I will say it doesn't matter really a 1e minus 3 let's say. Uh, it's not critical here. You just need to run it long enough to get a good transfer function and compute a reasonable number of averages. So let's go ahead and let it run. And let's auto scale our magnitude response on top, our phase response on bottom. Let me pull that, make it smaller. I have an additional display here for group delay. We're not interested in group delay today. And what you can see is we've got a magnitude response with a little bit of a dip around 50 gigahertz, and then it comes back up at the lower and higher frequency. So it's, it's kind of like a poor man's notch filter. And then you can see the phase, um, you know, the 360 degree type of transition at that anti-resonance point or around that anti-resonance point. So that's what the T-coil is doing here. Now, the next question is, or the natural question would be, uh, how does this work? Where did this block come from? So the short answer is I created this block using other more primitive blocks uh, from the Sim Simulink library. So let's take a look under the hood and see how it works. I'll just click the X in the lower left-hand corner. Uh, we'll drill under the mask. Remember, this is a masked subsystem. So when you just double click on it, you just see basic measurement parameters. So I wanna see how it works under the hood. So I hit the a little arrow. And what we see is we've got an excitation portion, a band limited uh, random excitation in, in this case, where that band limiting is set by that parameter I put on the mass, the 200 gigahertz number. And we also have a measurement portion where we measure the, the reference uh, signal, which is the excitation in our case. We're measuring the response, the output of our T-coil circuit, and then with a certain hold off time. Okay, we use an enabled subsystem. Uh, under that enabled subsystem, you see something very similar. You see uh, some block TFE, which stands for transfer function estimator. And we have our display devices for the magnitude and phase responses. So if we drill under the transfer function estimator or TFE block, what we're gonna see is we band limited or we anti-alias filter the two measurement channels, both reference and response where again, the bandwidth limiting is set by that parameter I set on the top of the block at 200 gigahertz in this case. I then sample at some, you know, two point X faster, some rate that meets Nyquist uh, beyond that uh, for, for that particular bandwidth. In this case, I use an oversampling ratio of 2.56 to allow for some transition bandwidth of my anti-alias anti filters, which you see here. And then we have a block from Simulink's uh, DSP system toolbox called the discrete transfer function estimator. Uh, that's going to be the block which computes the frequency response, the complex response output here, uh, which is going to basically include both the magnitude and phase. Uh, we are going to select certain non-alias indices from that. Um, so not the full uh, bandwidth, but, you know, a, a, a majority subset of that uh, output. We're gonna break it into its magnitude and phase respectively. We're gonna scale it dB 
and radiance to degrees. And then we're going to send that to our spectrum analyzers for display. Now, optionally down here, I output those numbers as complex numbers in case someone just wants to work uh, with the raw numbers instead of displaying it on the spectrum analyzer. That's what the TF or transfer function output is for. The transfer function estimator block itself is implemented as a system object. If you look under the hood of it, you're going to see that we buffer up so many values. That's based on the FFT size. And then underneath this block, uh, this is a system object implementation, which if you go back, I won't repeat it here, but if you go underneath the hood and look at the source code, you can find out all, you can look at all the MATLAB code as far as how it computes a cross spectrum and auto spectrum and takes the ratio to compute uh, the transfer function estimate. And that's pretty much how it works. Um, let me go back up again. Go back up again. I'll go back to the very top. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to share this example with you, which will, of course, include this transfer function estimator block. So you won't necessarily have to go build all those blocks up uh, yourself. Now, what I did uh, on, in my system, just to make it convenient, was I created a library with that block in it. So if I open up my Simulink library, just do that. Um, call this over for you so you can see it. It's on a different screen. And we go under my, I created a little uh, library of my own called my blocks. And under there, I have a transfer function estimator block and I can just pull that into my system every time I want it. So, um, that's easy enough. I don't have to uh, go building that up every time I need it or go looking for an example of it. Um, so if you use a block like that a lot, I'd recommend you do the same. Otherwise, you can just copy it out of one of your existing models and copy it into you know your the current model where you need it. Um, now, I, now, of course, here I showed how to measure the transfer function of this Simscape circuit. Uh, you could just as easily apply the same technique to other blocks like here I've got the same sort of, of implementation from an input-output perspective. You could you saw the transfer function of it here when I had it expanded. Uh, this is the equivalent transfer function of V2 over V1 in, as a Laplacian uh, ratio, poly, ratio of polynomials in S. You could certainly measure transfer functions of these kinds of blocks too. You could just wire it up accordingly, and we should get something very similar. Uh, I'll just hook this one up as well. So for the um, response, so it's much, it's actually much easier when you just have a transfer function block and we'll run it again. And we should get again, a very, very similar response. And we do, yeah. Now I will point out that this is a particularly challenging transfer function measurement just because it is a notch filter and notch filters are always a little bit challenging when it comes to measuring transfer functions because they're not low pass in nature, they're high pass in nature. And so it's easy to get into situations where these high frequencies out here, which are not being attenuated, can alias back in here. And that's what we're seeing here at the lower frequencies. This is not really distortion uh, or something which it may appear like. Uh, it's actually the aliasing effect of higher frequencies that are not properly attenuated uh, getting back into the lower frequencies. So uh, the averaging effect, of course, that's why I chose a larger number of averages, 100 to kind of diminish, minimize the effect of uh, that uh, aliasing uh, effect. Now, of course, what I'm showing here is um, a measurement. And like anything, you always want to be able to correlate your measurements against theory or other data that you have. So we're just showing one particular verification mechanism. And in this particular case, I had used symbolic toolbox to derive the transfer function of this. So I had a good idea of what the transfer function should look like before I started. Uh, so you always want to have some idea of what you're going to be seeing when you make uh, before you make uh, measurements. So here we're just kind of confirming the theory to make sure that we constructed the, the uh, circuit correctly. Uh, we, we implemented correctly in, in Simscape and we're simulating it correctly. So again, there's many different ways where one could get off and it's always nice to have multiple different methods to confirm uh, that your design is, 
uh, again, properly implemented, properly designed, properly simulated. All right, that's all I have for now. I hope that was very helpful and uh, look forward to future videos. Thank you.